Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Steve Walsh, the director of Texas Tech's Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. Um, we bring to the Texas Tech campus uh, speakers who address subjects of enduring interest and especially things that pertain uh, to civilization, um, Western and world. We also try to span the disciplines. So we have historians, uh, we have philosophers, we have economists, we have people in literature, and we have people who span various fields, uh, which is the treat we have in store for you today, a philosopher talking about poetry. Our speaker is Dan Bonavac, who is professor of philosophy at uh, the University of Texas, um, rivals, but friendly rivals, I'd like to think. Give him a big hand when he comes on, when I bring him to the center of the state. Uh, Dr. Bonavac is very well published, um, has, was it 11 books to your credit? Nine. Nine, okay, nine but counting uh, books to his credit. Uh, interested in a great many things, he just uh, some, something of a marathon runner when it came to making presentations because only an hour ago uh, he was doing a philosophy colloquium um, comparing uh, various forms of deductive analysis in Western and Indian philosophy. Um, so we're not all that far from India, I think, in today's subject. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you, you may know, I hope you do, uh, of a rather celebrated and memorable English author and poet uh, who flourished at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Rudyard Kipling. Um, Kipling wrote many stories uh, about the British Empire and, and India. Um, uh, we were just speaking about Ricky Kitavi a little earlier. Uh, of course, there's the, the Kim, the Jungle Book stories as, as well. But uh, he, was a, he was a poet, um, and uh, his poet has some, his poetry uh, is not only worth reading uh, for its memorable cadences, uh, but also has a lot to say about the, the condition of humans in a civilized world, and also at the edge of civilization, at the interface of, of different civilizations. Uh, one of his poems is God of the Copy Book Headings. That's the subject of today's lecture. And with that, let me turn things over to Professor Bonavac. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about a philosophical view that I find in Kipling's poetry and in his stories, um, and that in particular seems to me expressed in The Gods of the Copybook Headings. It is perhaps unusual to attribute any philosophical view to Kipling at all, as I'll mention. He's uh, always been popular as a kind of um, well, popular author, children, author of children's books and so on. Um, but lately, Critical opinion has turned much more negative on Kipling, and actually there was a strong negative voice from the very beginning. He shot from being unknown to stardom, really, on the international scene in the 1890s, and almost immediately the literary establishment began to uh, express some dismay over this. So you find ideas, or let's see, I've never controlled this from my iPhone before, so forgive me if I have trouble. Um, um, I, oh, it's not, oh, the connection was lost. That's bad. Well, we'll see if we can restore the connection. <laughs> but, oh, I think I've got it back. Good. Anyway, um, he was, in 1907, already awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. He is the youngest recipient ever of that prize. Um, and he's won high praise from many quarters. Roger Kimball, for example, says Kipling was above all the laureate, not of empire, but of civilization, especially civilization under siege. I think there is something right about that. He is something like a poet of civilization. On the other hand, a lot of critics have not been so kind. Here's George Orwell on Kipling. It's no use pretending the Kipling's view of of life as a whole can be accepted or even forgiven by any civilized person. Kipling is a jingo imperialist. He is morally insensitive. 
and aesthetically disgusting. Okay, here is Edmund Wilson on Kipling. The whole work of Kipling's life is to be shot through with hatred, hatred and fear of his fellows, anti-democratic, venomous, morbid, distorted. Well, that's a pretty extreme view of Kipling, but it's not, he's not alone. Here's Lionel Trilling. His imperialism is reprehensible. Not because it's imperialism, but because it's a puny and mindless imperialism. In short, Kipling is unloved and unlovable. Well, it goes further. Trilling says he was one of liberalism's major intellectual misfortunes. No man ever did more harm to the national virtues than Kipling did. Now, you might guess that is not my opinion, but on it's not just people writing about him 40, 50, 60 years ago that thought this. Here is the author of a recent book on Kipling. I assume that Kipling's political ideas really were particularly grotesque, perhaps lunatic. Um, he continues, Kipling's polemic is too one-sided. It incorporates personal, sadistic elements which have no business to be contained in it. Impractical, obscurantist, unrealistic, inhumane. It refuses to take account of individual goodwill and ignores under the thoughtless rubric of wickedness, all that it too mindlessly dislikes. Now, I think all of this is completely wrong, let me make clear, but I might as well pile on a little more to make my thesis seem that much more dramatic. Here, <laughs> one person who knew Kipling said he had the prejudices and opinions of a fourth form English schoolboy on almost every subject, coupled with an extraordinary verbal talent, the mind of a boy of 16 with a genius for expression. Well, Noah Lannan has continued this kind of argument, um, even though in some ways he praises Kipling. He puts Kipling in a class with people like Durkheim and Weber. Nevertheless, he says, he doesn't show us what the effect is of the social process on the individual. He's unaware of the problem set by concepts of roles. And in short, people, to the extent that they attribute a view to Kipling, think it's an awful view. Now, it's not even clear that it's right to attribute a view to him. Um, some people think Kipling doesn't even have a few. One of those people is Kipling himself. Speaking to graduates of McGill University, um, he said, on such occasions, very little truth is spoken. I will try not to depart from the convention. I have no message to deliver. And so he himself, when he's asked, actually asked to talk about values, denies having any conception of value at all. Um, and indeed, a lot of people have been reluctant to attribute any underlying view to him, any philosophical view in particular. Renwick says this, he describes his view as Philistinism, somewhat degenerate stoicism. His whole constitution, training, and habit incapacitated him for philosophy. Now, I'm going to, throughout this talk, read Kipling as something of a philosopher. And I think there is a philosophical position underlying his view, in fact, a really interesting one, and one that's worth taking seriously, by no means easily dismissed, by no means simple-minded or in other ways deplorable. But it's going to be not that easy, maybe, to see exactly what that view is. So let me take a look here, <laughs> you might say, at what his underlying view is. As the title of the talk indicates, I think he's giving us an ethics of civilization. Civilization is his basic unit. And he's going to be talking about that as the fundamental unit. So yes, he seems sometimes to be focusing on civilizations, but not because he's ignoring things like social roles or individuals, far from it. He's interested in the interactions between civilizations, between people in civilizations and the civilizations they're a part of. In fact, I think conflict is something that is absolutely at the center of Kipling's thought. Conflict between civilizations, conflict between different kinds of goods, conflict between different roles that people are expected to play within civilizations, um, and between different levels, between individual people, the rules that govern a society, between them and the social roles they're expected to play, the institutions of that society, and so on. So if we want examples of that, it's easy to find. In fact, looking over his works, I find it amazing that critics have not seen conflict and conflict among these various levels as really central. The individual versus an institution, think about Danny Deaver. Or versus a civilization, Gunga Din, you're a better man than I, Gunga Din. Or civilization versus nature in the Jungle Book. 
civilizations coming into clash with each other, as in Kim, or as in the notorious poem, The White Man's Burden. And then individuals facing other individuals within civilizations. Think about the Ballad of East and West, about two people who are part of conflicting civilizations coming into direct contact and conflict with one another, nevertheless emerging with great respect for each other. So all of that seems to me quite central. Well, I want to now get to what I take as the main text that I'm going to talk about that seems to me to allow us to get a sense of what this underlying philosophical view is. The poem is The Gods of the Copybook Headings. It was written in 1919, just at the end of the First World War. And you can see here it's based on the, the idea of a copybook. That's an old style thing that is no longer, I think, much in use in schools, but to teach handwriting. People would take some noble saying um, and then write that again and again to practice their writing. There was something similar uh, in music where people would take music and copy it down. Bach taught his students in part by giving them his own manuscripts and saying, copy these down. And just the act of copying the music was thought to teach you a lot about music. Um, I've actually tried that. It does work. You actually see how the piece is constructed by having to write out note for note what it is. In any case, here is the poem. As I pass through my incarnations in every age and race, I might, <coughs> I will start over. I'm not doing it justice. <coughs> As I pass through my incarnations in every age and race, I make my proper prostrations to the gods of the marketplace. Peering through reverent fingers, I watch them flourish and fall, and the gods of the copybook headings, I notice, outlast them all. We were living in trees when they met us. They showed us each in turn that water would certainly wet us, as fire would certainly burn. But we found them lacking in uplift, vision, and breadth of mind. So we left them to teach the gorillas while we followed the march of mankind. We moved as the spirit listed. They never altered their pace, being neither cloud nor windborne like the gods of the marketplace. But they always caught up with our progress, and presently word would come that a tribe had been wiped off its ice field, or the lights had gone out in Rome. With the hopes that our world is built on, they were utterly out of touch. They denied that the moon was Stilton. They denied she was even Dutch. They denied that wishes were horses. They denied that a pig had wings. So we worship the gods of the market who promised these beautiful things. When the Cambrian measures were forming, they promised perpetual peace. They swore if we gave them our weapons that the wars of the tribes would cease. But when we disarmed, they sold us and delivered us bound to our foe. And the gods of the copybook heading said, stick to the devil you know. On the first Fominian sandstones, we were promised the fuller life, which started by loving our neighbor and ended by loving his wife, till our women had no more children and the men lost reason and faith. And the gods of the copybook heading said, the wages of sin is death. In the Carboniferous epoch, we were promised abundance for all by robbing selected Peter to pay for collective Paul. But though we had plenty of money, there was nothing our money could buy. And the gods of the copybook heading said, if you don't work, you'll die. Then the gods of the market tumbled, and their smooth-tongued wizards withdrew, and the hearts of the meanest were humbled and began to believe it was true, that all is not gold that glitters, and two and two make four. And the gods of the copybook headings limped up to explain it once more. As it will be in the future, as it was at the birth of man, there are only four things certain since social progress began, that the dog returns to his vomit, and the sow returns to her mire, and the burnt fool's bandaged finger goes wobbling back to the fire. And that after this is accomplished and the brave new world begins when all men are paid for existing and no man, man must pay for his sins, as surely as water will wet us, as surely as fire will burn, the gods of the copybook headings with terror and slaughter return. Well, cheerful poem. I, I asked for fire and smoke here as a side effect, but uh, didn't get that. Anyway, what are the copybook headings? Well, the, I mean, they're absolute truths. They're eternal truths, as various commentators have said. Sage but perpetually forgotten advice, as Kimball says. Um, this poem, Lysette observes as his pee on the old-fashioned common sense, a stubborn instinctive plea for traditional noose, for traditional insight, in other words, traditional common sense, you might say. Well, Here's how Tompkins, who is very sympathetic, one of the few 
critics who was on, I'm not, more or less uncritically uh, praising Kipling. These are generalizations from human behavior, rhetorically worked up into pronouncers of the law, which is their essence. They're unescapable conditions inherent in human nature, witnessed by history and ignored at our peril. Now, there's something I want to get to before we see what um, is not happening here. Um, before we see what is happening, what is not happening here. John Rawls begins his famous book, A Theory of Justice, by saying justice is the first virtue of social institutions, as truth is a system of systems of thought. A theory, however, e elegant and economical, must be rejected or revised if it's untrue. Um, likewise, laws and institutions, no matter how efficient and well arranged, must be reformed or abolished if they're unjust. And in the end, nothing overrides that. This is, I think, exactly what Kipling is not doing. He is not giving us a theory of justice. He is not telling us what is overriding everything else. Far from it. In fact, I think he thinks if there is anything like a first virtue of civilization, it's survival. The first thing any civilization has to do is survive, is last. What good is a just society if it can't last, if it can't survive? So look at what's happening in some of these passages where he's criticizing views that have become orthodoxy. Um, here he took a stand against women's suffrage, for example, and he's arguing against feminism, uh, which started by loving our neighbor and ended by loving his wife, till our women had no more children and the men lost reason and faith. Is he arguing for a certain conception of justice here? Is he arguing that justice doesn't commit, demand equality between men and women? Not at all. He's not arguing on that basis. He's talking about consequences. And he's worried about possible consequences. He says, look, what happens if what follows this is a kind of sexual decadence? What happens if there are declining birth rates? What happens if there is a loss of reason and faith? Well, then society is in trouble. And so he's not really giving you an argument that justice demands something else. He's basically saying the universe isn't particularly just. <laughs> you can value justice, but in the end, that's not what matters. What matters is, will a civil civilization dedicated to this way of thinking survive? And he's worried that it won't. And there's some justification for that. Here are birth rates across Europe, for example. And actually, you can see only Ireland there and Turkey have replacement birth rates. Everywhere else, it's below that. Kipling would say, I told you so. <laughs> um, look at this argument. By robbing selected Peter to pay for collective Paul. But though we had plenty of money, there was nothing our money could buy. He's giving you an argument here against socialism. And again, it's not an argument based on political philosophy. It's not one based on a conception of justice. He's just saying, what happens? Well, he's saying, yeah, there was plenty of money, inflation, but nothing our money could buy, shortages. He's predicting economic contraction and hardship. He's saying, look, if people get paid for not working, they won't work. <laughs> and there are going to be problems. Maybe justice requires such a system, but he says it won't last. It runs into trouble. These are store shelves from the old Soviet Union and from East Germany. And you can see his concerns here are not entirely unjustified. But in any case, whether you're, they're justified or not, his point is not to present an argument on a normative basis, really. He's not saying, I have a different conception of justice. Um, he's just saying, what really is the test, ultimately, is will a civilization espousing these values and having this sort of system survive? In the end, he thinks, <laughs> look, what really matters is, finally, what happens? Is it terror and slaughter? Is it the tribe disappearing off the ice fields? Is it the lights going on off in Rome? Or is it a civilization that survives and thrives? Now throughout, I think he is focusing on consequences. He's saying, let's test a philosophical theory, a theory of justice, not in terms of some abstract argumentation, but instead on the basis of its consequences. Implement it, see what happens. Is it good or bad? <laughs> so throughout all of this, it seems to me, he's focused on consequences. What happens when we do certain things? And he sees that as the ultimate test. There is a philosophical view like that, known as consequentialism. 
says moral value derives entirely from the consequences. I think that is his concern. He's not starting from an abstract conception. He's starting from real life consequences. In the end, he does have conceptions of virtues. He has certain civilizations he champions, but nevertheless, that's not what's fundamental. What's fundamental is this question of can this civilization survive? Can it thrive? So, I think I'm moving around too much and losing the connection as a result. So, there are a variety of you. Oh, whoa, I've leapt forward a lot. Let me go back. It started listening to me, but too late. Here's the usual form of consequentialism. It says, look at an action and judge the action by its consequences. So this is Jeremy Bentham, the first person to articulate that view, really. Um, we approve of actions according to the tendency they appear to have to augment happiness. We're talking about each individual action. Should I do this? Should I not do this? It depends on the consequences of that action. Um, John Stuart Mill agrees. We look at actions as right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness. And so we're judging individual actions here. We can judge things act by act. But a lot of people have felt uncomfortable about that and have thought, no, the basic foundation is not actions, but instead rules. So maybe we should think about general rules instead. After all, if we have to decide with respect to each individual action what its consequences will be, that's going to get complicated fast. So maybe we should think about general patterns of action, rules, policies. Bishop Barclay had something like that view. We should think about the consequences, but in terms of the rule framed with respect to the good of mankind, our practice must be shaped by the rule. So he's saying we don't decide each individual action case by case. We think about a rule. We decide it's a very good rule to have, let, let's say, people not murder other people. And then we follow that rule. We don't have to think about each individual potential murder as a separate case. And here is another version of that. <laughs> we will think about generalizing across all the relevant cases. But now we might go further than that. We might say, well, it's not so much rules, but motives that are fundamental. And so we might have a view that is a motive consequentialism. Um, and various people have argued in favor of that. It's the patterns of motivation we judge. Or maybe we talk about character and think about states of character, virtues, as being things that are states of character with good vice, with good consequences. Um, R.M. Hare has a view like that. But we could keep going in this direction. We could think about whole institutions and say, actually, a lot of what we do is shaped not case by case, not even by general rules. I mean, I don't know about you. I don't walk around thinking, hmm, should I come into murder today? <laughs> I don't do that. Instead, I play a certain role. I think a lot of what I am obligated to do depends on my role, on my role as a husband, my role as a father, my role as a professor, and so on. And so I think in terms of my role in an institution, well, this is one of my students, Jeremy Evans, who developed a view known as institutional consequentialism. You could say one institution is better than another if it has better consequences. Then what are my duties? It's to play an appropriate role in preserving good institutions and in strengthening good institutions. Now, before moving on beyond that one, I want to say there is some real power to that. Think about the rules we use in driving. There are rules that are at a kind of individual level. Things about traffic laws, for example, saying you must do this, you must not do that. We can also talk about character and talk about good character traits to develop in driving, defensive driving and so on. But there's another level, and in a sense, all of those depend on that higher level of designing the transportation system in the first place, thinking about the design of automobiles, the design of traffic systems, and a lot of what amounts to the rules of the road are going to depend on that larger picture about the traffic system. It matters whether you're driving on the streets of Lubbock or the streets of New York City or on the Autobahn in Germany um, or on a rural road in Scotland that's one lane. <laughs> there are going to have to be different rules and what will constitute good driving is going to depend on that overall system. So. Evan's point is, really, that's the most fundamental thing. We start by designing a good system, and then we determine what are other good virtues and good rules to have on the basis of preserving and strengthening that good system. 
And indeed, we can develop an entire theory, as Alan Page Fisk has, for example, in relation, relationship regulation theory, saying, yeah, what kinds of roles do we play? What relationships do we have within institutions? Sometimes we're completely sh dedicated to sharing. Sometimes there's a hierarchy and we obey our superiors and nurture and develop our inferiors. Sometimes we're equals, as in a friendship or peers. Sometimes we're strangers and interacting in the marketplace. And all of those things are different roles. They all have their different rules. They all depend on the structure of the institution that we're part of. I think Kipling is pushing this one step further. He is actually saying the basic unit is not the act, not even the motive or character, not the institution, but instead the entire civilization. So we start by saying, what is a good civilization? When does a civilization have good consequences? And then our role is to protect and strengthen a good civilization. So. Think about the passages from the poem, a concern that a tribe has been wiped off its ice field or the lights had gone out in Rome. We're talking about entire civilizations that in this case cease to exist or become transformed and destroyed. He's concerned with the consequences for civilization. And then what is a good institution? What is a good character trait to have? What is a good rule? Those are all defined in terms of preserving and strengthening civilizations. But the civilization is fa fundamental. That, I think, really is a distinctive philosophical view. I think a very powerful one, and one that one cannot really find in the philosophical literature anywhere, I think. But notice these distinctions that I've been drawing are really independent of consequentialism specifically. Suppose you don't like that. You'd think, oh, no, there's more to it than just the consequences. It's okay in a certain sense, because although I think that is Kipling's main concern, these distinctions apply across any kind of ethical theory. Pick your favorite theory. You can still think, am I mostly concerned with actions or with my motives or am I thinking about character? Kipling says, whatever your view of what makes for the goodness of a civilization, think about that first. Okay, that's the primary concern. Everything else is derivative. Everything else in the end is going to be explained in terms of that. Any theory of any kind is going to have to decide what explains what. And I think his main concern is to say it's the level of civilization that is really the chief explanatory level. Well, how could we choose? I want to give us three arguments we might use for trying to push from one level to a more abstract level. I want to start by looking at the arguments that are used, actually, by people who are rule utilitarians to push us from act consequentialism to rule consequentialism, and then see if they generalize and keep pushing up us up these various levels. So what are those arguments? How do people go from acts to rules in thinking about the basis for an ethical theory? As far as I can tell, there are three arguments that people use fundamentally. One is an interdependence argument. So basically, acts and their consequences depend on one another in a way that makes that not the proper unit. I can't tell what the consequences of my action will be until I have some idea of what other people are going to do. A second argument is sensitivity. There are certain phenomena that emerge at the level of rules that are just not evident at the level of individual actions. And the third is vulnerability. How vulnerable is this to people making mistakes? Mill's main concern, <laughs> you might say, is really how do I make people not make mistakes in their calculations about the consequences of individual actions? He's worried that even his own theory is going to constantly lead to people making mistakes. So let's think about this interdependence argument. Can we evaluate the expected consequences of actions when they're considered in isolation? The argument is we can't. We have to think about what other people do. Our actions have consequences together when people act together. There are lots of examples of this in simultaneous games. So in a prisoner's dilemma, if I cooperate and you don't, then I'm in terrible shape. That's the worst case scenario for me. There are other games where if I cooperate with you and you don't cooperate, well, I'm no worse off. My effort is completely wasted. There are other cases where if I cooperate and you don't, I benefit anyway. The effects of my action in all these cases depend on what you do. So an example used by Brian Skirms. We're in a rowboat. I start rowing. 
hoping that you'll row with me. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. If you do, then great. What if you don't row with me? Well, in this kind of situation, I actually end up worse off. I suffer. <laughs> uh, in this kind of situation, well, okay, I'm rowing, but it does me no good. Um, maybe I'm on one side of the boat and you're on the other, and I trust that you're rowing on your side. If you're not, we're just going around in circles. My effort is wasted, but at least we're not worse off. Here, well, yeah, if I row and you don't, at least we still get there, maybe slower. So that's a kind of situation. A more obvious situation is rock, paper, scissors. Or in this instance, rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock, okay? From the Big Bang Theory, where whether my play succeeds depends on what you do. It's the patterns of action we have to think about and not individual actions. We can't determine the consequences without knowing what other people do. Well, in all these cases, the consequences of my action depend on the actions of others. And in that way, you might say the same action could just have radically different consequences, depending upon other people's behavior. So I can't tell, I can't tell what the character of the act is alone. The best I can do is think about the general rule. And if I think about that, I may be much better off. Well, okay, let's consider, yeah, that's just showing some people accept this kind of thing. I want to look at that sensitivity argument. Okay, there might be certain phenomena that appear at the level of higher abstraction that don't appear at the lower level. So the example in Herod's article on rule utilitarianism is that if I create a certain amount of pleasure for myself, that has a different moral character than my creating that amount of pleasure for someone else. So I help someone else as opposed to helping me. I create the same amount of happiness in the world judged as actions, those are equally valuable. But actually, we think the one is, well, at best prudence. Okay, I'm doing the right thing for me. Great. But if I do something for someone else, foregoing that pleasure than myself, let's say, for the sake of someone else, well, then that seems like an ethically noble act. If the child buys, buys an ice cream cone and eats it, okay, fine. But if they buy the ice cream cone and give it to a friend who enjoys it every bit as much, <laughs> but no more, that seems like a selfless and noble, admirable act in a way that just eating the ice cream cone doesn't. But we can't really capture that at the level of the consequences of the action. We have to look at rules. And then the question of vulnerability. If I'm judging things action by action, it's easy to make mistakes. What will the consequences of this particular action be? It's hard to tell. Calculations are complicated. The effects are hard to foresee. We tend to distort calculations for our own benefit. We may reason very poorly about low probability results. In fact, people generally do. Um, we ignore them unless somebody points them out and then we obsess about them. Um, but it looks like focusing on rules is a bit less vulnerable. It will keep us from making those individually motivated effects, uh, mistakes because we think about kinds of action where we're not necessarily involved. So the rules seem indifferent or at least more indifferent to our own advantage. But now we can take the same arguments and apply them to go one more level up, at least, <laughs> to thinking about institutions. So I'll just go through this very, very simply. In fact, in Herod's classic paper, a lot of his examples actually talk about institutions instead. Notice here he's talking about <laughs> this advantage being recognized or possible only if recognized institutions exist to define a system of obligations. And that often happens. So we might have to think about a general pattern. Well, he does that a lot in the paper, so I'll skip through some of this. But just say, here's the general point. Can I judge a rule in isolation? Maybe I can't. Maybe in the end, I have to know what other rules are in place. So I think about a rule that is instituted in a traffic system, for example. Can I say whether that rule is a good rule to have independently of what the overall traffic system is? Not necessarily, right? It depends on the overall system. A rule in this system that works might not work in that other system. Or think about an educational institution. It might be that a rule that is a good rule governing classroom interaction in the United States is not a good rule in Germany. Um, I had a friend who went from teaching in the United States to teaching in Germany. And he found that the way he teaches in the United States couldn't be done in Germany. Um, 
He used a lot of interaction with the audience, constantly asking the students questions. He found, at least at his institution, you couldn't ask German students questions. They wouldn't answer. They would just stare at you. You are Herr Doctor Professor. You're supposed to be telling us the answer. We write it down. <laughs> and the ethic there, the system was quite different. So the same sort of rule did not work there. It depends what other rules are in place. Well, yeah, there's the same kind of problem that arises, you might say, with general questions of strategy in game theory. Whether this strategy, this pattern of choosing actions is going to work will depend on what other strategies are being used by other people. The same thing happens, I think, with sensitivity. Are there phenomena that emerge only at the level of institutions? Two rules could seem equally good in isolation, but put them in a certain institutional context and they might be very, very different. They might interact with other rules in a way that gives them consequences you wouldn't anticipate in isolation. Um, an institution also might have purposes that could be promoted or set back by a given rule. So it's easy to imagine in a university, for example, that there are certain goals of a university. Certain practices might promote that goal. Certain others work against it, even though in isolation, in a different kind of institution, those might work just fine. Then what about vulnerability? Well, we can say the same things about rules. Calculations about rules are complicated. The effects are, again, hard to foresee. We have a tendency to distort calculations to our own advantage because, after all, some rules are going to benefit us more than others. And again, we may reason poorly about these low probability results. So in short, it's hard to see why rules solve this problem, even if there's something of an improvement. Well, it looks like thinking about institutions makes us a little less vulnerable. Institutions are the kinds of things that embody generations of experience. We can foresee the effects of kinds of rules more clearly, you might say, <laughs> than the effects of particular rules. So we can think more about institutional structures and their effects than particular policies. You might, for example, favor democracy without being sure whether a given policy is really a very good policy. And then institutions are even further from considerations of our own advantage. Well, I think Kipling makes the move beyond that to civilizations, and in many ways for the same kinds of reasons. Just as we say it's to our advantage to move up a level of abstraction because of those problems, the same thing happens at this level. In the end, we can say with Herod, who's arguing for rules here, but many of his arguments actually have to do with something much larger. He can say the great proximate ends are all dedicated to the preservation of the human race and of an ordered civilization. And I think that is precisely the kind of view that underlies Kipling. So here's the idea. I can't evaluate even institutions independently, I have to think about the role they play in a civilization. Is that institution a good institution? It depends on the role it plays in interaction with other institutions within a civilization. It depends what other exist civilization or whether other institutions exist and what they do. So we can't judge those in isolation either. They depend on broader cultural features. <laughs> you can see an example of that with voting systems. Here are different institutions, you might say, for conducting democratic elections. But what voting system should we use? There are a lot of different possibilities. It might be that we can't really evaluate that without thinking about the other values of that, of that civilization, the problems it's facing, the ways in which it, this will interact with other institutions in that civilization. What about that question of sensitivity? Are there phenomena that emerge only at the level of civilization? Kipling, I think, thinks there are. Two institutions might appear equal in isolation, but very unequal in given civilizational contexts. So they might have in that context, in interaction with other institutions, effects they wouldn't have by themselves. And civilizations, like institutions, might have characters and goals that could be promoted or hindered by a given institution. So something that would be a fine institution, let's say in the United States, might not be transplantable to some other country. Something that is a fine institution there might not be transplantable here because of a difference in civilizational setting. Well, finally then, vulnerability. Institutional <laughs> consequentialism is also vulnerable to error in a way. After all, I'm already embedded in certain institutions. It's very easy for university professors, for example, to say, 
we need more funding for education, <laughs> okay? Uh, natural for us, it's not so much that that funding will benefit me personally, but we're playing a role in an institution. We're gonna be biased by those institutions too. And so calculations about the effects of institutions, if anything, feel incredibly complicated. Um, the effects of changing institutions can be hard to foresee. But it looks like if we think about civilizations, maybe we're less vulnerable. Um, they embody not just generations, but millennia of experience. We can maybe foresee the effects of general kinds of institutions within civilizations by looking at earlier civilizations. Here, a knowledge of history will be vital for us. And that seems even further from considerations of our own advantage. Once we take this broad historical perspective and think, what makes certain civilizations great? What makes them last? What makes them in the end fall? Um, we have some grasp on what is a virtue for a civilization that doesn't depend on our particular character traits or our particular role in it. But now, why stop there? You might worry, keep going, Kipling. <laughs> Get to something truly global. In the end, what if we just say it's about a world from civilizations to, well, something else, something truly global. Can we mount similar arguments about civilizations themselves? These arguments about interdependence, about sensitivity, about vulnerability. I'm not so sure. At first glance, you might think we can, that civilizations are gonna run into the same problem. Think about interdependence. Can we evaluate the expected consequences of a civilization by itself without thinking about what other civilizations exist in that world? Do the consequences depend, in other words, on what other civilizations there are and what they do, what they're like? Well, you might think the answer is yes, it does depend. And in fact, I think to some extent, this explains Kipling's fascination with the interaction between civilizations. It's not just that he was born in Bombay and then moved to England and then moved to the United States and then back to England. But I don't think he fully accepts this. The implications aren't what they first appear. So here's the first reason. Civilizations face similar problems and similar threats. Maybe in one given setting for a short historical period, the Earth is rel relatively peaceful. A civilization exists largely in isolation or in a, an environmental setting that supports the practices of that civilization. Maybe there is no hostile tribe about to take over that land and so on. But Kipling's point is wait long enough there will be droughts. Wait long enough, there will be a hostile tribe. Wait long enough and civilizations encounter over history the same kinds of problems. So in the end, I think he thinks, look, the time scale here averages all that out. At any given time, yes, what works for a civilization may depend on what other civilizations there are, but over a long stretch of time, they're gonna need the same virtues because they will face the same threats. Now, a particular global context, yeah, it'll have its own threats, but over, times, over time, they tend to be the same. What about the question of sensitivity? Are there phenomena that emerge only at a global level, um, a level above that of civilizations? Maybe two civilizations appear equally valuable in isolation, but in a given world, it's different, <laughs> and they seem to have different effects. Well, can, Civilizations interact to have effects they wouldn't have in isolation. Um, again, I think actually Kipling thinks over time, this all averages out. <laughs> the answer appears to be yes, but I think he denies it. That's what the gods of the copybook headings is really all about. The same kinds of threats, internal and external, are going to face civilizations. The fool's bandage finger is gonna go wobbling back to the fire. There will be the same kinds of things happening again and again. Those things are universal, and the tendencies in human nature and in civilizations that lead to these problems are universal. So they really end up being independent of any particular global setting. Think that right now we're lucky all the civilizations agree in this? Just wait, Kipling says. Um, these problems are going to emerge. And so basically, if you want something that will persist for millennia, you're going to run into trouble. Well, finally, is this also vulnerable to error? Calculations, after all, about the effects of civilizations are complicated. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire is a very long book. And the effects of changing a civilization are hard to foresee. 
Well, all that's true. But if we had a more global, let's call it a cosmopolitan, consequentialism, would that be any less vulnerable? I think here Kipling's answer is no. It would actually be more vulnerable. You could argue, oh, maybe it would be less vulnerable. Actually, it too involves millennia of experience with this world. But here's the problem. He says, we can become familiar with different civilizations. But for one thing, we can't really become familiar with different worlds. Also, <laughs> we inevitably, inevitably make predictions and judgments on the basis of our own civilization. We can learn about others. We become broader in our perspective. But in the end, we're going to have some sort of perspective. We can't jump outside of a civilization, jump outside of anything like that and make any judgment. And actually, evaluating worlds gives less constraint to the tendencies that he thinks provoke the terror and slaughter than thinking about the health of a civilization. To the extent that I'm devoted to strengthening and preserving my own civilization, I have something with real values that will guide me to knowing what something about what preserving that and strengthening it would be. But if I say, I want to make the world a better place, that gives me almost no guidance at all. Actually, I have no idea what that would involve. And it gives, un basically it allows my imagination, my utopian vision to reign unconstrained. So he thinks in the end that people who try to take this cosmopolitan perspective really end up being know-nothings. <laughs> and they pursue a kind of narcissistic vision of utopia. He says, <laughs> yes, it's what draws us toward this uplift vision and breadth of mind. And that does lead us to go wobbling back to the fire. So here he is speaking again at McGill. He says, I have no message to deliver. But if I had a message to deliver to a university, which I love, to the young men who have the future of their country to mold, I'd say with all the force at my command, don't be smart. Now, that's a bizarre thing to tell university students, right? Don't be smart. But I think he means don't try to be cosmopolitan in that sense. It doesn't work. If I weren't a doctor of this university with a deep interest in its discipline, if I didn't hold the strongest views on that reprehensible form of amusement known as rushing, I would say that whenever and wherever you find one of your dear little playmates showing signs of smartness in his work, his talk, or his play, take him tenderly by the hand, by both hands, by the back of the neck if necessary, and lovingly, playfully, but firmly lead him to a knowledge of higher and more interesting things. So here's the idea. I think to the extent that you start thinking about the whole world, you're going to be led to your own narcissistic vision of what that is, unguided by the values that have been built up over millennia. And there is something higher. You're going to think you're rising above your civilization, but you're not. You're descending back into your own desires, your own fantasies, your own wishes. And really, there is a huge amount of value in your civilization already that is there. It's higher than those things. It is more interesting. It is more highly developed. It is subtler, more capable of surviving. So a great example of this is his attitude about what he takes to be the cosmopolitan of his era, Woodrow Wilson. He writes to a variety of people about Wilson. Here's a letter to Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> he describes Wilson as an immensely ignorant intellectual, a man unconnected by knowledge or experience with the facts of the world in which we live. And it's precisely Wilson's cosmopolitanism that drives him up a wall. He says, one sometimes wonders how much blood that man might have saved while he was so busy saving everyone's soul. And I think that's his worry. This sort of pursuit of a utopian vision actually ends up undermining civilizations. It ends up being something that leads people to pursue some unattainable goal at the expense of the actual institutions of the actual civilization around them. He says, <laughs> at root, Wilson is strictly neutral to everyone except himself. There's the narcissism coming out. Oh yes, I'm neutral, I rise above everything. Except, of course, <laughs> Wilson's vision of the future, which he tries to impose, in the end, unsuccessfully, on the world at the Treaty of Versailles. Well, there are various things you might do here. I'm not going to go into all of the details. I will just say, so what is this ethics of civilization that I think Kipling is arguing for? I'll just say one very quick thing, really, about it. There's one ultimate moral aim that civilization be as good as possible. We should act to promote the good of civilization, preserve and strengthen it. And there are 
some aspects of that. It is really the strengthening of civilization that he cares about. Um, one of the few people to, I think, get Kipling right on this is Lord Birkenhead, who wrote a book in 1978, where I think he saw what Kipling was trying to do and lays it out this way. It was an indifference to internal progress that caused Kipling's preoccupation with defensive vigilance. It was because he realized that for every single thought for the embellishment of life, there must be 10 for its actual preservation. So he sees the reality of external threats, of internal threats, thinks that the most important thing we can do is defend against them. Um, as Birkenhead puts it, civilization is fragile. It's a little citadel of light surrounded by a darkness full of malignant forces and only maintained through the centuries by everlasting vigilance, willpower, and self-sacrifice. And here is how Actually, where is it? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, oh, I talked about a lot of things here. But in the end, ah, well, maybe it's enough to end with this. Ah, I've already promised to end. There are many, too, I was told there were many too many slides here. I was right. So there are lots of ways of elaborating this. But what I'm really looking for is one simple quote. Oh my gosh, and now I don't remember where it was. Yeah, well, maybe we, we can end here. If the primary value is civilization, then there are all sorts of virtues connected to preserving it, to strengthening it. And he cares most about the people who place themselves at risk on the line to strengthen it and put themselves on the line to preserve it. So the, the, the most noble people in Kipling's poetry and in his novels are the soldiers, those who are actually on the line putting themselves at risk. Those who are behind the lines and often pontificating in the universities are the least respectable. <laughs> They're the ones who are not putting themselves on the line. But what really matters in the end is not the good of individual people, though the conflict between the good of individuals and civilizations is constantly his concern. But that doesn't mean that we define the good of civilizations in abstraction from the good of people. What makes a civilization good is that it's good for the people inside it. And so it's not as if he has some independent, crazy, utopian conception of a civilization either. He thinks what makes a civilization good is the fact that being in it is a good thing in general for its people. And then we have to think about, well, <laughs> what I have to do, not in terms of pursuing my own good, but in terms of promoting the strength of that kind of civilization. So the consequences are always consequences for individual people. But the fundamental unit of analysis throughout is really the civilization. And so that means really in the end, as he puts it in <laughs> the law of the jungle, the strength of the pack is the wolf, but the strength of the wolf is the pack. What makes the civilization great is what it does for the people in, within it. But what makes those people great is what they do to strengthen and preserve that civilization. Thank you. Yeah. So you were talking about how time kind of averages out uh, across was the, the, the aspects of the civilization, like the threats or the internal, the external threats or pressure points basically on the civilization. <coughs> What's your view in, in terms of like technology, which we have not seen to such a magnitude or in many ways such a unique way in the past, really within the past 30 years with the advent of the internet, the, connecti the connectivity between all these nations from uh, the, the purely democratic in many ways or to the absolute authoritarianism. Like what, what's your view based on that and does it still hold for now in the future considering the, that, the, the aspect of technology? Ah, that's a oh, great question. Yeah, the difference technology makes is in part in putting civilizations in contact with each other and in part in speeding up this entire process. So it may well introduce, in addition, changes that are hard to foresee. 
Um, at first, when the personal computer was introduced, for example, it was seen as this liber liberating force, something that would inevitably lead to the destruction of certain institutions. The Soviet Union fell, the Berlin Wall fell. It felt as if that kind of authoritarian structure was incompatible with this kind of technology. Now that we've seen the growth of as it were, the surveillance state, we start having the opposite worry. Wait, maybe we're all trapped by Big Brother in this one huge um, system where none of us have any privacy at all. And it's making people worry about things going in, the dif in a different concern. Um, I think it's too early yet to tell us what the effects of technology will be. So it is complicating those calculations. On the other hand, I think Kipling would say, but still you're asking the right question. You're saying, what is this technology going to do for civilization? And what now will make a civilization good for the people within it, given that technological setting? Um, that kind of question has occurred before with the advent of the printing press, for example. Um, for that matter, maybe three to 5,000 years BC with the advent of writing. Um, there are huge effects of that effects that are immensely hard to anticipate, it may well be that some of those technologies end up changing what is a successful civilization and change what we ought to be doing within that context. So I think those are, <laughs> William Butler Yeats had the view that civilization proceeded in great cycles. And the way he develops the view, it seems highly mystical. But a non-mystical way of developing this would be to say, we have one set of answers as long as our technology remains at a certain kind of level. But then the moment you invent writing, or you invent a form of transportation that actually gets people around effectively, like the combination of, let's say, chariots and Roman roads, um, or you get a technology like the printing press, or now one that's involved in computing, all of a sudden you're in a new cycle where new pressures come about that actually don't have close analogs in previous cycles. And it could be that we are entering one of those cycles where suddenly uh, civilizations have to do something new that they haven't had to do in the past. I think his question is still, yeah, think about the civilization, but it may be that here millennia of experience isn't going to help us much because we realize there is something fundamentally new about this kind of case. I'd like to say the analogy with the printing press is the closest maybe, but it's one thing to be able to print and circulate ideas within a certain area. It's quite another to have something printed and now everyone in the world can access it forever. <laughs> and sometimes it feels as if that's now the situation we're in. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm almost totally sympathetic to everything you, you say, which is very weird for me to hear another philosopher saying things that I <laughs> um, So let me, let me give you a kind of classic challenge. It's not entirely this um, So, I mean, you know, we like to think that we're in, in an equilibrium and we stay here for just keep doing things. Um, so, uh, but you know, that, that's not really true, of course, so that things can come apart internally or, or in some of the slides you zip through so the external challenges. Right. Um, so, you know, the, the usual argument from away from act consequentialism is we do better by deferring to, you know, to, some, to rules or to other people or you know, some such thing. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, come on, right? What gets this all going is the good, and we all, you know, we want the good. Uh, if we can see, you know, that, that uh, in at least some cases, we've got this tradition, sure, it did work well enough. But I can see so clearly, right, that, that if I just depart, it's just my case, right, maybe it's just this once, right, you know, right. Um, I won't have a family or whatever. Um, or, you know, and I'll tell them, yeah, don't get married, that's all, you know, don't do that. Um, so so what, what, should, what should we think? Should, should we, you know, go it alone, as it seems like, you know, we really should, or, or you know, for, for a rule that seems very good to us, or, you know, should we, should we stick with this, this system of traditions? Right. Uh, yeah, good question. Um, John Stuart Mill, in fact, uh, at one point received a letter from John Venn of Venn Diagram fame asking him basically in modern terms, 
I don't understand your book, Utilitarianism. Are you an act utilitarian or a rule utilitarian? You talk about these secondary principles, but I don't know whether they define what's right or whether they're just helpful tools in getting what is really right, which is the individual action and its, uh, its tendency to promote happiness. And Mill's response is to say, well, I mean for the act to define this. On the other hand, I think it's better for people to actually act as if they're following the rules, because I think usually when they'll make an exception to the rule, they'll get it wrong. <laughs> so it's sort of the vulnerability point. But on the other hand, he makes it clear that nevertheless, what makes an action right is its effect on consequences. So the right thing to do if you can break the rule and do better is break the rule and do better. You'll just probably screw it up in practice. But in theory, that's the right answer. And I think there is a real challenge here. Wait, in the end, okay, the good of a civilization depends on its good for people. Well, if in this case that person benefits, even if it weakens the civilization, isn't, but I, I'm saying on balance now, nevertheless, it benefits this person so much. And I think that is the kind of thing that you see emerging in these stories in, in Danny Deaver, in um, Ganga Din, in a number of the others, the Ballad of you, you see these conflicts where somebody feels duty bound to do this, even though you get a sense what this is doing for civilization doesn't compensate for the harm to this individual person. And one way of looking at Kipling is to say they're both real and it's just a real moral conflict. Um, and another way to look at it though is to say I think he does have a response, but I don't feel very confident of this. It's tempting to me, for me now to start philosophizing and say, well, the problem is you can't pursue your individual good apart from the health of that civilization. The way in which you organize your life and so on so much depends on it that we can't think about your individual good in isolation. But in reality, I think that's not Kipling's concern. I think he thinks in the end, no, it's more important that you do your duty. And why? Partly it's a vulnerability point, like Mills, but I think partly he's thinking, if we all, if that's what right action is, <laughs> civilization falls, okay? At least if we start acting that way. But even, even apart from that, what, will, what that will lead to is each of us doing calculations on our own. And it's not just that we might make mistakes, but instead there is a sense in which all of these things work together in a way to produce phenomena that are valuable quite apart from what's happening down here. <laughs> and so this focus loses all of that. Now what are those? I think that's part of what he has in mind by the higher things he refers to. Those things that emerge at that level of civilization. But what are those things? Here I think it's harder to define. It's not just that, hey, it, that helps us understand what we're doing and structure our lives. I think he thinks, no, there are things about a civilization that have value it ultimately depends on the individuals, but it only emerges at that level. And there you have to think really, what are those things? Um, I think it's a little hard to say exactly what they are, but um, it's part of the reason I think that he wants people to focus on, on history. He wants people to focus on literature. He wants people to think about the kinds of achievements that are possible and the kinds of virtues and the kinds of goods that can emerge from a civilization that aren't the product of individual action. And he wants to say, look, yeah, you made a huge sacrifice and I have tremendous respect for that. That was ethically an amazing thing to do. But look at what kind of good you made possible. Maybe it doesn't outweigh the, the cost to you because your contribution was minor and spread across all of this. But look at this. <laughs> so I, I don't know if that's satisfying, but I get the sense that that's the kind of answer he wants to give. Yes. So I, I, I'm not familiar enough with the totality of, of, of Kipling's writings and ruminations about society and civilization. But I wonder if you couldn't make a case that the nods the practical canons, uh, if it's about consequentialism, is much more about rule consequentialism. Uh, and it's kind of Burkean. It's uh, arguing that uh, let's go with the rules that have been time-tested and enduring 
the things that have seen humanity as a whole, whatever the civilization happens to be, uh, to the extent that anything sees humanity through stress and strain, the things that have tended to work best. So, you know, and, and, and his here is, is utopian thinking of various sorts. Uh, so he starts off by uh, talking about uh, don't disarm. I mean, people are talking about one world and pacifism. Don't give in to that because right. um, you have to be rightly suspicious of, of other people's of motives. It's just the human condition. Uh, you have to be prepared to defend yourself. And then people are preaching equality of the sexes. But after all, there's no society unless the sexes do what the sexes were created to do, form families, bring children into the world. Uh, otherwise, you're, you're lost. And, and finally, um, uh, you, better, you better incentivize people uh, to work hard and to produce, because if you don't, they won't. Um, now, these things aren't peculiar to any particular, any working successful society, let alone a civilization. Uh, right. abides by rules of this kind. And when he talks about the gods of the headings, he's talking about rules, after all, the rules that you cop copy over and over again. Right. So, I, I, you know, maybe elsewhere he, I, I don't see in this poem uh, right. a uh, elevation of, of the target of one's ethical uh, contemplations uh, to the level of civilization. It, it seems to me be saying, in fact, don't really think about it too much. Do what's been handed down to you, you know, as the, the heritage of humankind. Uh, right, right. Okay, good. Um, there are different, there are different uh, poems of Kipling where it seems to me he focuses on different aspects. So, indeed, the copybook headings are rules. He's not, you're not writing civilizations down again and again. Um, though typically these things were famous sayings by famous people and so forth. But nevertheless, they were expressing those kinds of common sense rules, well supported by experience of generations and so on, expressing the wisdom of the, so, of the society. And, and so it looks like this poem is about rules. Um, if is a poem that seems to be about virtues. It's talking about you know, what it is to be a person, and you've got to be the kind of person who actually exhibits these virtues. So if you look at if in isolation, it looks like he has a virtue ethic. If you look at this in isolation, gods of the copybook headings, it looks like he has a rule-based ethics. But I think a more careful reading of those, together with some other things, makes you think, wait a minute, those all have a role because we can still talk about actions being good insofar as they serve the civilization. Rules being good because they serve the preser preservation and strengthening of the civilization. Virtues doing the same thing. But in the end, there is that kind of civilizational structure to it. Let me go back to, ah, here's the poem, If, which talks about virtues. And most of it is about virtues. Um, and a lot of it kind of Aristotelian and finding a sort of mean. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too and so on. But think about this. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose. And start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. I think there's something there that is connected to this sort of idea um, of being able to actually accept risk, accept adventure, um, and that looks directly like a virtue, but why is that a good thing? Why is it important to be able to love adventure, risk, and uncertainty? Um, it's not so much that it'll be good for you, though I think he thinks it will be. It'll be very good for the situation you're, or civilization you're a part of. And if we go back to Sorry, the copybook headings, they're way back. But there we go. Um, maybe I'm making too much of this. But, yeah. What happens when we ignore these? They, all, <laughs> they always caught up with our progress, and presently word would come that a tribe had been wiped off its ice field, or the lights had gone out in Rome. We're talking about a civilization. Okay, we disarmed, they sold us, bound to our foe. Um, there was no more children, the men, <laughs> there were no more children. Men lost reason and faith. Um, 
these monetary phenomena. But then notice it's terror and slaughter that return. All of those seem to me civilizational disasters. So I agree with you, this is about rules. But I think he's saying you don't view the rules in isolation. You view the effect of that rule, rule on a civilization. It could happen to a nation, though, too. Oh, sure. It can happen to a nation. It can happen to a society. It, but the point is, it involves a pretty large-scale unit. It's not that if you don't have children, you suffer necessarily. Maybe you do. I, I think that would be too bad. My kids have contributed an immense amount to my life and are valuable for their own sake. But nevertheless, you know, maybe you're better off without children for various reasons. But a society is not better off without children. If it has no children, it won't survive. And the same thing is true of some of these other things. Um, you get paid just for existing, um, kind of like a tenured professor. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, um, maybe that's good for you, but a system like that may not be good for the civilization and so on. So I think you're right to say this poem is mostly about the rules. But as I see it, why are these rules good? Why are these rules bad? because of their effects on something larger. It's, it's always the societal consequence, not the consequence for the people who directly violate the rule, let's say, or their victims or something. It's not like the rule of not stealing is good because it hurts the victims of theft and so on. Um, it's not like that at all. It's a very broad social concern. So if you don't like civilization, you might say society or um, something larger than the individual institution or one practice, but something that involves a sort of whole unit. The reason I didn't say society here is that I think that historical dimension for him is crucial. And so society we tend to think of often as kind of at a time or at least a limited period of time rather than as something that stretches over millennia. Thank you very much. Excellent. Mm. Thank you. Good. Thank you.